Greetings, wherever you may be attending this uh, special session of the International Space University. Thank you so much for connecting, whether you are on YouTube or on Zoom or any other uh, virtual uh, channel that you may be using. Uh, we are very proud to offer uh, to all of you what is probably uh, the last uh, lecture in uh, the academic activities of uh, the International Space University uh, that we open to all of you. And um, we have uh, some special people who will uh, speak to you in a moment. We know you are here uh, for our very own ISU alumna, uh, Jessica Mir, but you're also here for the experience. And I would like uh, in the name of the university, uh, uh, give the floor now uh, to the person who will uh, introduce uh, the main speaker. Uh, my name is uh, Juan de Dalmau. I serve as the uh, president of uh, ISU. And you can see on the background a special image that um, we will not uh, describe to you in detail right now, but uh, we just want you to observe it. Uh, there may be other people uh, in the room who also use it. Um, but now, uh, since uh, you have already recognized that this is the Cathedral of Strasbourg, it is my honor to um, introduce um, Madame uh, Julia Dumay, or Julia Dumay, who is uh, recently elected, only since uh, last June, I believe, uh, Deputy Mayor of uh, Strasbourg. Uh, Madame Dumay, you are in charge of uh, international relations and uh, especially European relations. Uh, for the city of Strasbourg, uh, so that uh, brings you naturally very close to this uh, International uh, Space University that uh, you already had the uh, chance of uh, visiting in person when it was allowed uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, Madame Dumay, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hello to everyone. So um, thank you to the International Space University. As you said, I, I was able to visit. Um, and it was nice to meet you all in, in person. Uh, thank you, Juan de Dalmao, uh, Nesa, and uh, especially Jessica Mayer for making this event possible in our city and on our territory. Uh, we are especially proud that Jessica Mayer accomplished part of her training at ISU and are impressed by her career and the fact that she managed to join the quite close community of astronauts. I'm happy that we can today share this event with the citizens of Strasbourg and thus enable them to get to know ISU better. Strasbourg, the city of Strasbourg and the Europe Metropole of Strasbourg supports ISU since the beginning and we are proud to welcome this higher education institution on our territory. We are involved with ISU in the fields of education, research, but also in the project of an incubator that uh, follows up with startups. Knowing that the spatial sector offers the solutions to understand better and manage the issues related to climate and health makes us think that this technology might be the solution to act for an economic and urban growth that is more respectful of our planet. I won't be much longer and look forward to learn more about Jessica Mayer's experience. Thank you. Uh, Bolshoye spasiba, merci beaucoup. I intentionally used uh, Russian, uh, uh, Ms. Dumais, because uh, we know that uh, part of your international uh, experience and uh, learning uh, has been uh, in Russia. So if uh, anyone has a question about uh, uh, Russia, uh, please, Madame Dumais, stay with us as long as you can. We know it's a busy day for you today at the city. You have important meetings, but you did find the time to uh, join us for this uh, special occasion. Balshaya uh, Spasiba, again. And um, now let me uh, please um, introduce uh, the audience uh, to uh, astronaut uh, Dr. Jessica Mayer. Um, I hope um, that we can call you Jessica to make it shorter, uh, but also uh, to follow the example of your uh, administrator who uh, was speaking to the International Space University last August. And when we introduced him as administrator Bridenstine, he said, call me Jim. 
and that made it much easier. So thanks, Jessica, for uh, allowing us to call in you, uh, Jessica. In your audience, uh, in addition to the uh, numerous uh, members of the ISU community worldwide, and uh, we know we are being followed by uh, space enthusiasts and friends uh, around the world, but you have a special group in front of you, uh, Jessica, and this is the class that is uh, studying exactly the same program as you did exactly 20 years ago. It's the Master of Space Studies uh, 2021. Uh, they've been waiting for this moment. Um, they come from many different countries, uh, different backgrounds, including marine biology, believe it or not, and many other disciplines. Uh, they are working on uh, two uh, team projects. Uh, one is called Space Medical Center. Uh, so it has something to do with your job. And the other team project is about uh, space for sustainable oceans and especially uh, for the problem of plastics on the ocean. Now, as a marine biologist, I'm sure this uh, comes close to your job and to your uh, research interests, uh, Jessica. So please share with us what you remember from Strasbourg, uh, other than the cathedral and the moon that you can see on the poster as well. Uh, back over to you, Jessica. Good morning, everybody. Morning for us over here, but I know it's evening for you. Bonjour. It's wonderful to be here today and to be able to speak to the entire wide ISU community. Of course, I had a wonderful time when I was at ISU in the master's program way back now, 20 years, as Juan just said. I can't believe how much time has passed. So what I wanted to do today was give you a little bit of a, a glimpse into my background and my career path of course, including those pivotal moments at ISU. But I really wanted to leave most of the time for questions. So we'll have maybe about a 20 minute presentation and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. So with that, I'll just share my screen here and start my presentation. Yes, it works. Okay, excellent. We're all becoming masters of this virtual technology, like it or not. So I have entitled this talk, Experimenting in Microgravity, Full Circle for a Scientist Turned Astronaut, because as you'll see, there have been many different circles that have been completed throughout my life and trajectory in coming here. And ISU was of course a very part, important part in one of those circles. My journey started here. If you can recognize this land mass, this is a picture from the International Space Station. You can see just like an edge of the solar array there. And there's that familiar, Cook up here of the Cape of Cape Cod in Massachusetts. This is actually where I grew up in a small town all the way up here in northern Maine. And from the time that I was five years old, my mom tells me that's when I first started saying that I wanted to be an astronaut. I was also fascinated by biology. That was my favorite subject. I think perhaps since I grew up in a, in a small town with a lot of trees, my mom's from Sweden with a close connection to nature. So all of those things, I think, really instigated this passion for learning more about the world around me and exploration and just wanting to know more. And I think that that eventually led to this desire to explore and to be an astronaut. I started involving myself in space related activities from that childhood time, but I would say it was 1999 when I had my first foray into microgravity research. And this was a parabolic flight. Of course, I'm sure you've probably heard of the Vomit Comet or the airplane. You have the, the it used to be the A300. I'm not sure if Kness is using a different airplane now with their program in Bordeaux. Um, but this, these airplanes can fly in a, in a pattern of parabolas in order to achieve brief bouts of microgravity, about 30 to 35 seconds. I can tell you it's a lot different than prolonged microgravity that you actually have in space, but it is a great start. And my first time writing on that vomit comet was as an undergraduate student. When we designed an experiment, it was selected to be flown. That was the first time I came down here to Houston, same city where I'm sitting today, and got to come to NASA and to conduct this experiment in microgravity. That was not long after, after getting, getting my bachelor's degree at Brown University, that I heard about ISU. Now, interestingly, I'll go back a slide here because this project also involved one, our advisor on this project was a student named Peter Lee. 
And he was working in a lab with me. I was doing my honors biology project and he was an MD PhD student. And he had a passion for space, just like I did. And so we used to have long talks about this. And he had been a student at, at ISU as well. He was the one that actually told me about ISU for the very first time. I had never even heard about it. I thought, what? There's a university entirely dedicated to space? And it was only a few years old at the time, which is perhaps why I hadn't heard of it. But he was the reason that I applied and got interested in it in the beginning. And he was pivotal in this project as well. And a really cool story, he was also an investigator on an experiment that I conducted on board the International Space Station. So 20 years later, Peter played this very pivotal part of my life and of course an ISU alum as well. So in 2000, I, I well, 1999 to 2000, I headed off to the International Space University, as you know. And of course, like all of you, we spent a lot of time in the classroom and just, it's interesting, we actually had a nice virtual reunion for our 20th, 20th anniversary uh, just, just a, a couple months ago. And it was so nice to reconnect with all of my classmates, unfortunately only virtually for now, but we did what we could. And so I, I, we had a repository of all of these pictures that I hadn't seen for so long. If you can imagine that was before we had all of these digital images. So a little bit harder to, to capture all of these moments. So thanks to my classmates from our MSS5 class for helping get photos together. I stole some of these from our shared drive. But another parallel here, another circle being completed, because I'd had this experience on the parabolic flights before I came to ISU, I was fortunate enough to go with one of the investigators to Bordeaux for a few days and to ride on the Knesset's airplane as well. As you can see, we were doing some cardiology experiments, cardiovascular studies, looking at blood distribution and, and some other factors with, heart, with the, the dynamics of the heart and the heart valves. And this is a lower body negative pressure device here so that you can pull the blood back down to counteract that weightlessness. And of course, it's a lot of fun on these airplanes as well. And here we are, you know, having a little bit of a good time after the, after the studies were completed. Wouldn't be complete without sharing this memory of the Strasbourg lights and the, the Christmas markets in the area and celebrating the holidays with my classmates from MSS5, as you can see here. This is not actually the Christmas market itself, but it reminded me of that. One of my favorite things was the Strasbourg Christmas market in Place Broglie. And I actually lived in an apartment in Place Broglie. So it was a wonderful location. And I'm very sorry to hear that there is no Christmas market this year, but I'm sure it will be back in the future for all of you to enjoy. So back to my transitions and those circles being completed. In 1999, as I mentioned, I was a student scientist and after ISU, because actually of the work placement that I conducted, the internship that I conducted as part of my master's, I ended up getting a job at the Johnson Space Center. So again, back here in Houston, another thing, thanks to the Space University, I, I was very, you know, I had, when in deciding where to do my internship, I actually really didn't want to go back to the US, of course, I wanted to go somewhere else and get some more international experience but I also wanted to try to get a job afterwards. So it was quite important, I think, that I ended up going to Houston and making those connections and it did lead to this job. I came back here to Houston and I was working as an experiment support scientist. So I was a person on the ground that was serving as a liaison between whichever investigator had a study that would be flying on back then the space shuttle and also the beginnings of the space station. Here you can see I am training uh, at, uh, Spanish astronaut Pedro Duque, who is now, of course, some of you may know his name in Europe. He's quite quite a big deal now in Spain and in all of Europe. And I'm training him how to use the ultrasound before he headed to the International Space Station. As these circles become completed, I was fortunate enough to serve as a crew member on a CAVES expedition, an analog for spaceflight training in the European, uh, put on by the European Space Agency. I have some pictures of that too, if you wanna, if anyone has questions about that CAVES mission, but I probably won't, won't get to all of that in this brief talk today. So my next transition, after spending three years working as a science coordinator, I had a lot of incredible experiences at NASA working as a scientist. I even got to do an underwater mission, one of these analog missions. So like I was just saying with the European Space Agency's caving mission, we have a mission called NEMO, the NASA Extreme Environment Mission Operations. And these analogs serve as a very useful training pl platform for astronauts in that if you're trying to train astronauts or test hardware, or you're trying to do something to replicate some of the characteristics of space, how do you do that on Earth? 
And how we do that is through these analog environments. So find an environment that somewhat has some of these characteristics in common. Maybe it's an isolated environment. Maybe you need a life support system like living underwater. Maybe you're in a small confined space with a small crew, all very similar to how we live and work in space. And I got to do one of these missions when I was working at NASA as well with two astronauts, Scott Kelly, whom you may have heard, and Rex Walheim and Paul Hill, a flight director. So incredible opportunities. But at the same time, even back when I was at ISU, I knew that I wanted also to pursue an advanced degree. And I was considering doing a PhD or perhaps going to medical school, given my passion for biology and physiology, but I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. And that was another reason why going to ISU was so important and such a great and valuable opportunity for me at the time, because I knew I wasn't ready to choose and, and make this four or eight year commitment to somewhere else, but I knew I was interested in space. And living in, the, in Central Europe for a year sounded incredibly appealing. It was a perfect platform for jumping into the rest of my trajectory. And that was one, another one of the reasons why I went to ISU. But after these three years at NASA, I got back to that yearning to conduct my own, scientist, my own science. I knew that I had such an exceptional opportunity and I had done such incredible things working at NASA, but I thought that it was time for me to leave at least for a while and to do my own science. And I became very interested in diving physiology. So trying to understand, like I mentioned, I had been fascinated by animals, by nature from the time that I was a child. And I just had this yearning to, to learn more about them. I saw these animals that were capable of incredible behaviors, deep diving animals, high altitude birds, incredible migrations. And as a biologist and as a interested with this interest in physiology, I wanted to understand what was special and unique about their bodies that allowed them to excel in those kinds of extreme environments. And again, I think it was this passion for exploration, for understanding the physiology and extreme environments that really was what inspired me. So I left NASA and I started a PhD at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, studying these diving animals. As you can see, there's an emperor penguin over here. Emperor penguins are the best diver of any bird. They can hold their breath for 30 minutes. So imagine 30 minutes longer than I'll be talking to you today, not breathing the entire time. And these are breath holding, air breathing animals, just like humans, but how do they have this superior capacity to breath hold? That's what I wanted to understand. And this is an elephant seal as well. Elephant seals can hold their breath for two hours. So even more impressive, mammals just like us, and they can hold their breath while actively foraging and catching fish and their meals for the day, all while with this very, very low heart rate. So to me, that was extremely interesting. And we put instruments on these animals, both tracking and physiological data measurement devices to understand more about their behavior. So I was fortunate enough, again, I think with this spirit and passion for exploration to go to the Antarctic to study these animals. I went to the Antarctic five times actually, four times for that research and one time actually just to, to test out some diving gear um, in the underwater environment. So here's an example of these birds diving below the ice with our heart rate recorders and our oxygen recorders. So we could actually measure the heart rate during the dive or the level of oxygen in their bodies during the dive. And as I mentioned, I was fortunate enough to do some diving down there myself. If you like scuba diving, I definitely recommend this. It is definitely the highlight of my diving career, diving in the Antarctic. And as I mentioned, we did similar studies with elephant seals. And here you can see that in the beach, on the beaches of California, Northern California, where we were doing the same kind of studies, trying to understand more about this exceptional diving capability of the elephant seal. After completing my PhD, I was interested again in extreme physiology. I still wanted to pursue more work with the diving animals, but I was also very intrigued by these animals that live at high altitudes. So the same kind of problem where they're living in this environment with an oxygen challenge. Of course, they're not holding their breaths, but they're flying at an altitude so high that there's very little oxygen there to support that. So what I did here, and this I would say is the most difficult thing I've ever done, far more difficult than becoming an astronaut, was raise a flock of geese in order to train them 
these geese were imprinted on me. They thought I was their mother, which enabled us to eventually fly them in a wind tunnel instrumented with all of these different data collection devices so that we could understand more about this iconic bird, the bar-headed goose. So this goose migrates over the Himalayas, over the tallest mountains on the planet twice a year. So as I mentioned, similar kind of problem to a diver in that there's an oxygen limitation, but again, because they're at altitude. So here is one of my geese and you can see it's wearing a mask so that we can change the amount of oxygen that it's breathing to simulate that high altitude. And it also has some recorders uh, looking at its heart rate and also oxygen levels, sort of like those diving animals. So then that brings me to another circle being completed. And this, these, after these very, very interesting years being a comparative physiologist and studying all of these incredible diverse animals from these deep divers to these high flyers, of course, I still had that goal in the back of my mind about becoming an astronaut. And that's probably what you hear, want to hear more about, maybe even more so. I get really excited talking about these animals again, since I don't get to do that as much as often. Um, but I know you're here to talk more about space. And so this is where I say the final circle was completed, where I made the transition from being a scientist to now being a subject. And I think this was kind of my due, it was time for me to pay the piper here where I had organized science, then I had conducted my own experiments on these animals, and now it is time for me to be the subject and for me to be the one poked and prodded in the name of science. Of course, we do a lot of that on the International Space Station, a lot of different physiological and medical experiments, as well as experiments ranging from protein crystal growth, material science, radiation, you name it. As you can imagine, as a scientist, it's incredibly exciting to be on the International Space Station doing all these experiments, knowing that you have removed this elephant in the room, this omnipresent gravitational vector that has been part of every scientific system ever on Earth. So as a scientist, so exciting what we might uncover up there really in any scientific system when you remove such a large variable. Here's another picture of that transition. You can see we're very heavily instrumented sometimes in the name of science. This was for an experiment, a Japanese experiment called cerebral autoregulation. So I'm here in the Japanese module and the main goal here is to look at the changes of blood flow to the brain in microgravity. So now back to ISU, that's why we're all here today. And it's a very exciting time for all of you at ISU. And of course, that is because we are celebrating 25 years of the MSS program. I mentioned when I was an undergraduate student, the MSS program was only a few years old. That's because I actually started my undergraduate career in 1995, the same year when, when ISU, the master's program started. So 25 years, very exciting to be celebrating this with all of you. And interestingly, 2020 is also a really important year. It's, a, it's a, a, big, a big year all around. And that was, as I mentioned, it was 20 years ago that I graduated with my Master's of Space Studies in Strasbourg. And there's a photo, again, that I stole from that repository with some of my classmates here. So, so nice to, to fondly remember the cathedral and all of my classmates. So I think I like your version of the cathedral painting now even better. I think I'm gonna to have to start using that background. 2020 was also incredibly important for us, all of us here at NASA. And that's because it wasn't just the 20th anniversary of my graduation from ISU. It was also 20 years of a continuous human presence on the International Space Station for us at NASA this year. And that is a huge accomplishment if you think about it. Probably, you, I don't know if you have any students that are, that are 20 or younger in, your, in the class this year, but if you imagine there has been a continuous human presence on board this laboratory for 20 years now, an extraordinary accomplishment where we have conducted so many different types of scientific experiments and so many efforts in the world of space exploration, technology and hardware demonstration. So a very exciting time. And I also like to compare a lot, all of these similarities, you know, the ISU, the three eyes and the way that we work at the, on the International Space Station, 
There is so much in common and so many valuable lessons that I learned at ISU that really are part of everything that I do as an astronaut here today. The first one's obvious, the international component. Everything that we do on the International Space Station is collaborative and international by nature, working with all of our international partners, the Russian Space Agency, the Canadian, Japanese, and European Space Agencies. Intercultural, a natural part of that international element, and I can tell you it's one of the best things about life on the International Space Station, living and working and learning more about all of the different cultures of your crewmates, just like it is for you as a master's student at ISU. And interdisciplinary, of course, everything that we're doing up there. I'm a biologist, a physiologist, but I'm on the space station doing things like spacewalks, flying the robotic arm, fixing the toilet when it's broken, changing the light bulbs, and doing experiments not only within my own discipline of biology and physiology, but ranging to it, all those different disciplines that I mentioned, combustion science, protein crystal growth, radiation, material science, cell biology, all these different types of experiments. So everything that we do has this interdisciplinary approach and understanding how to think that way and the valuable lessons I learned at ISU definitely helped me be a successful crew member on the International Space Station. So to wrap up here, we have to, of course, mention the future. This is a picture of the ISU patch that I flew on my mission, and I actually have the patch right here in my office, so hopefully that will make its way back to ISU in, this, in the near future as well, so all of the students and staff and personnel at ISU can enjoy it. But I know it's been a very, very difficult year. I, I mentioned how 2020 was such an important year for me personally and for space exploration and, and for all of these milestones, but of course it has been an incredibly challenging year for everybody on the planet. And that's one of the things when you're so fortunate to look out of this view on the cupola, to look down at the earth and see all of the interconnected land masses and oceans and realize that we're all in this together. You really understand how we are truly one human. And I think that's an important perspective to remember. And we know that in understanding that we will be able to get through this. This, is a, this global pandemic is an issue that is affecting everybody on the planet. But as my father used to always say to me, this too shall pass. And I think that that's an important statement to remember. And it's not only for those bad things or the negative things, hopefully those pass sooner than you, as soon as quickly as you can hope, but it's also to remember to cherish those good moments because those good moments are also transient. So I wanna remind all of you that although this year has been incredibly difficult and perhaps not exactly what you thought it might be, this too shall pass. And as we look toward the future, it is an incredibly exciting time. There's so much unfolding in front of us. As you may have heard, we at NASA recently introduced some of the crew members that might be going to the moon on the Artemis missions. And I was fortunate enough, I am fortunate enough to be part of that group. And going back to the moon, it's the next step. It's what we've all think about when we think about space exploration. It's incredible that we have these 20 years of that continuous human presence on the space station. But the next step, of course, is to leave low Earth orbit and to return to the moon where we can demonstrate our stable environment there, have this sustained presence on the moon and eventually go on to Mars. And now to go back to ISU and MSS-5, I found this slide as well in this drive of all of these things that my classmates still had. And I've got a copy of it right here in my office as well. This was our team project and it was the Autonomous Lunar Transport Vehicle. So it seems very timely in looking back at this 20th anniversary for our class with the Artemis announcement, perhaps I need to look back and reread this project that my classmates and I put together because maybe some of these technologies will be helping us eventually land on the moon. And that brings me to close with thinking about your team projects. I was so excited to learn about this Space Medical Center application. And this was, again, something that had a lot of parallels for me. Remember, I mentioned training the ultrasound way back when I was training Pedro Duque in 2001 and 2002 to now 20, 2019 and 2020 when I was on the space station using that another a different ultrasound system. And this, this picture 
is from an experiment where we were looking at differences in blood flow in various blood vessels with respect to what happens in microgravity. And this is a great example of telemedicine where I was being led by investigators on the ground. They were seeing these images real time and helping me obtain better images. I know for your project, you're looking even further into the future where you wouldn't have those direct communication pathways. And interestingly, my crewmate, Drew Morgan and I, I don't have a picture of it here, but we actually did some tests for that during my mission on the space station, where there is some software that they've developed to do exactly that, autonomous ultrasound imaging. If we don't have a communication pathway to be led by the experts on the ground, can we navigate through the software ourselves, whether it's to do science or it is to diagnose a crew member if there's a potential medical emergency? And Drew and I had a lot of fun testing that out. He is a medical doctor and he was an army physician and he has a lot of experience with ultrasound. And of course I had some experience with ultrasound as well. So we were really excited to be testing some of that capability. And it sounds like you guys will have a lot to add to that. So I'm very excited to see what comes from that. And then again, as Juan mentioned, you know, for me as a biologist and always having this passion for the environment, um, it is something that, you know, for me, it was always an important part of my life. But for astronauts, so many people have talked about how it changes them so much when they go to space and they see the Earth with their own eyes from above. And it, it's just like those early, the early Earthrise photos from the Apollo missions, which were absolutely pivotal in creating the environmental movement. Because when we looked down on the Earth from the first time with our own eyes, we saw how special, how fragile our Earth was how they had this thin, tenuous band of an atmosphere and that we knew that we had to do our best to protect it. So I'm so encouraged to know that these bright young minds are approaching this problem as well, because we all know, nobody can deny that we have a very sig significant problem of waste and pollution in general, particularly in waste and plastic in our oceans. And I can't wait to hear what you guys will be proposing. You know, we do use the International, International Space Station already for a wide, array, a wide array of Earth sciences. There are so many different instruments that are mounted on the outside of the International Space Station. These experiments usually get a little bit less in attention because people like to see the images of us inside using different pieces of hardware. And as astronauts, we really don't have much interaction with these external pieces of equipment but they are equally as important in providing information about our earth. So I can't wait to hear what you guys are proposing for this monitoring of, of pollution from space. So with that, I think we'll move into time to answer all of your questions. I'm sure everybody has some and I, and I wanna make sure that we get to those today. So I will stop sharing my screen and, and thank you very much. Well, we thank you, Jessica, for this uh, incredible summary and very appropriate to, to the audience uh, today or uh, tonight. And uh, I think another sign of optimism is that uh, our very own uh, Deputy Mayor, uh, Madame Dumais, is still with us. And um, while you were speaking, uh, she was allowed to walk around the city uh, to see if all her uh, diplomatic offices and embassies and consulates were still there. Uh, because, you know, Jessica, we're not all as privileged as you are to uh, be able to access our office. Um, <laughs> so uh, sometimes we have to be out on the street. And that's what Madame Dumais was doing. I think you have counted 75 diplomatic representations and consulates in uh, Strasbourg. Is that correct, uh, Madame Dumais? Uh, please, over to you. Yes, that's right. Although uh, we don't meet a lot of uh, colleagues right now, um, only on Zoom, of course. Um, but I wanted to say to Jessica that uh, I am right now in my office. I'm in the town hall, which happens to be at Place Broly. So it's uh, another circle that, that closes. I just had uh, one question to you um, because uh, I, I don't know the exact statistics uh, nowadays, but I know that both in science and probably also, um, yeah, as like sp space astronauts, it's um, not so current to have women in that field. So I would know how it was your experience uh, over these years as a, as a woman and how it um, played in your, in your career. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Very, very many fond memories of Place Broglie. So thanks for that. 
Um, yeah, well, I think that I was incredibly fortunate throughout my life growing up. I didn't actually ever have challenges in thinking I can't do this because I'm a woman. And I know that's not the case for everyone. And we certainly have still a ways to go. But I think it was in very, it's very encouraging to look how far we've come. For example, as an astronaut, I started in 2013 and our class was made up of eight individuals. And it was the first time in history that it was equally represented. There were four females and four males. So it was the first time we had 50-50 representation in our class. We aren't quite yet there in terms of the whole office, but we're definitely trending in the right direction. And as you may know, I was also fortunate enough to conduct the very first all-female spacewalk with my crewmate and friend, Christina Cook. So this is something that I've talked a lot about, and it's interesting to think about. It's really been an evolutionary process for me too and how I've interpreted it since, as I mentioned, I was fortunate enough to not feel those challenges before, but all the attention that this has generated has really made me think about what an important moment that was. And when we think about it, it certainly, it isn't as an important achievement, an important personal achievement for us. What we see is that it's important to pay tribute and really an homage to these generations of women and other minorities that came before us that were really the ones that were pushing the boundaries and breaking those glass ceilings when we certainly didn't have a seat at the table. We do still have room to grow, of course, but it is very encouraging to see how we've come thanks to them. And so I hope that they look at that spacewalk and they look at the state of things now and they see all the female faces on, on the stage for the Artemis astronauts. And they realize that that's because of their work. And that's, that's why we're fortunate enough to benefit from that. And now it's our role to keep inspiring and to keep moving that forward. Thank you. Uh, it is inspiring a lot of people, uh, not only here in Europe, but also in the United States, where we know a good number of uh, colleagues and friends are uh, watching this uh, live. And all those uh, US citizens, uh, including some of our students who are uh, connected uh, here, are uh, represented uh, today by the Consul General of the US in Strasbourg, um, uh, Ms. Dara uh, Paradiso. You were able to join us also, uh, even if it was a little bit into the session because of your uh, agenda today. Uh, Ms. Paradiso, um, would you like to uh, say a couple of words to uh, Jessica Mir? I would love to. Thank you so much for having me. It is an absolute delight to see some Strasbourg friends here. Um, it's true, we're not getting out of our offices much these days, so it's really nice to see the vice mayor um, and to see our friends at ISU as well. And what an honor to have a chance to meet Jessica and to meet the students of ISU online. Um, and I do have a question for you, Jessica. I'm so, it's, I didn't get to see the entire presentation, but it is so interesting and fascinating to see the photos and to be able to see a little bit of your work. I loved that you talked about international cooperation and the intercultural aspect of it. So my question is going back, if you think back on your course of education, um, what advice would you give people who are now studying and who are aspiring to do the kinds of missions you do uh, about preparing for that aspect of the work? How can they best prepare? I mean, you guys are ambassadors in your own rights and making connections across cultures on the space station. Um, what, what's the advice you would give to prepare for that? Well, I think first of all, to make sure that you're doing what it is you're truly passionate about. To me, that is the only way to ensure it's something that you'll excel at and something that you'll be excited to talk about, to serve truly as an ambassador. And the only thing I think that will make you happy in the long run. So finding that passion, that's number one. Number two is to make sure that you understand it is going to require a lot of hard work and perseverance and that you need to recognize that you will sometimes need to take a risk, sometimes need to go slightly outside of your comfort zone and that it's okay to fail along the way because that's when you learn the most valuable lessons. So do that, recognize that's all part of the process and there's a lot of luck involved as well. So I think you know those are, are really the main things, just to make sure that you're still satisfying that curiosity, that you're asking questions. That innate scientific curiosity is what advances basic science. It's what allows for us to explore. It's what allows for all of our society to improve and evolve. So keep asking those questions and foster that creativity 
and that inquisitivity, inquisitivity, that natural desire uh, to explore, to, to have that curious element. Inspire that in your kids and inspire that and foster that in yourself as well. Excellent. Uh, I have the impression, Jessica, that you are recruiting uh, more students uh, to our university. I think uh, we already have uh, Madame Dumais and uh, uh, Madame Paradiso who are looking at uh, the website to see which course <laughs> they could take because they want to learn more. And since this session is dedicated to the students, let's move on to uh, the ones who are now enrolled in the masters. And uh, the first one to submit a question earlier this week uh, was uh, Laia Lopez. Uh, Laia, what is your question? Hello, Jessica. Uh, first of all, I wanted to tell you that I think I speak on behalf of the whole MSS 21 class. And it's a pleasure for us to be able to talk to you. And uh, my question was to know from your point of view, from the point of view of an astronaut, which do you consider is the main challenge of long term missions? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And the long duration mission has a lot of challenges. I think the biggest thing is the isolation and the confinement, knowing that psychologically you're far away. So it's a personal problem, but it's also a logistical problem too, like we talked about with your medical project. If you need medical attention or support, you either need to be trained or have the equipment on board or have the capability to pull in an expert from the ground to guide you, or I hope with this autonomous system perhaps that you guys are developing, all of these things will help understand and how to function and how to overcome those problems of the isolation and the confinement. I think that's probably the biggest thing is understanding what it's like to operate in those environments logistically, but also psychologically as a human as well. Laia, any follow-up question or are you okay for now? Oh, thank you for the answer. I think uh, we are taking notes for our TP project. <laughs> yes, you might get back to Jessica. She's an alumna, so she should be available. Um, Absolutely. Thanks, Laia, and, and greetings to all of the class. It's so nice to have you all here. Uh, great. Another member of the class uh, is uh, Sami uh, Rousseau. Uh, Sami, what was your question again? Hi. So um, you could say my question is a follow-up question because I was wondering um, if you would compare the isolation people are currently facing because of the COVID situation to the one you experience on your training and um, your stay at the ISS. Yeah, absolutely. So when I launched into space, it was September of 2019. We'd never heard of COVID, of course, before. Um, when I returned in April of this year, it was to a completely different planet. So that was actually extremely strange. It felt quite surreal to see that situation evolving beneath us. But I think there are some similarities and also some differences to that type of isolation and confinement. For me, actually, it's more difficult to adapt to this isolation now here on our planet Earth than it was for space. And I think that's because isolation and confinement are a natural part of what we do in space. We expect that, we train for it, we're prepared for it. We know that's just part of the mission. And it's, there's a very good reason for it, of course, because through the window is the vacuum of space. And we understand why, why we have that. I think coming back down to Earth and dealing with this, this new planet and the way things are right now, that is much more difficult because our society is not built that way on Earth. Even for the biggest introvert, I think it gets a bit old staying inside and working in our home offices and doing all of this virtually. So I find it to be much more challenging to deal with on Earth. But I think a lot of the things that are in common can help you deal with life on both. And that's something that we know because we benefit from our training and experience. And we actually tried, we made some videos, Drew Morgan and I made some videos from the space station to try to help people and give them some tips. But some of those things I think include keeping a schedule. Sometimes it's tempting to just, you know, roll out of bed at the last minute and start your day in pajamas. But I think it actually does make a psychological difference if you wake up and you get dressed in the morning and you make the effort like you would if you were going out into the world. I think that actually helps you perform and helps you get into that psychological state. It's important to keep to a schedule and to make exercise part of that schedule. You know, we know that exercise is so important, not just for our physical well-being, for our mental well-being as well. And to demonstrate all of those good teamwork skills, many of which you're learning at ISU, especially when it comes to working with an international interdisciplinary team, 
communication, as I'm sure you've realized, is so important, especially when you're dealing with the challenges of, of speaking to people with so many different native languages. So strong followership and leadership and team care and self-care, being able to take care of yourself, but also be a valuable team member. All of these things are lessons that we learn and train as astronauts and are very, very important for all of our socialization as well. And I think this challenge of being in close confines with a few people brings out all of those skills. So a lot of, lot of similarities between the two. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I hope Sami uh, has uh, now material to, to continue. Uh, lots of uh, ideas, uh, Sami. Thanks for the good question. Uh, Jessica, if you still have a couple of minutes, uh, we would like to move on now uh, to another question coming from uh, Alexander. Alexander Hushke, please. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, hi, Jessica. Um, thank you for this really interesting presentation. Um, one of the things you mentioned were uh, that you said, Thing that I would also really love to try. And um, so my question is, how did you specifically benefit from scuba diving for becoming an astronaut and also being an astronaut? Like, um, like a, a very difficult situation where you specifically benefited from this. Yeah, so, well, for a couple different reasons. First of all, I think everybody should scuba dive because there is a whole world underneath our oceans. As we know, oceans make up a majority of our planet. And there is a whole different world down there that I think is, is really only experienced with your own eyes and your own bodies. It's pictures and video. It's great to share it that way, but you can't quite experience it. So I think just for the terms of exploring our planet and for what that gives you as a human, it's so important. But there are a lot of parallels as well between how what we do, especially when you're thinking about more hardcore technical scuba diving, for example, using a dry suit and using the equipment that I did in the Antarctic with an overhead environment, those kinds of situations and safety protocol calls, there's a lot in common towards scuba diving and toward how we do spacewalks, for example. First of all, knowing and understanding your equipment and trusting your equipment, very, very important to take good care of all of your equipment for scuba diving and to trust it that it will save your life because that's what it's designed for. But to know that sometimes it can fail and to know what to do in an emergency, all those, the very, very same lessons that we have in space in dealing with everything that we do that keeps us alive. And of course, in even more extreme environments, since you're in a pressurized environment in space, we can't just come up for air but all of these things have a lot of overlap. The safety protocols that you use and technical diving, if you have a tether out, um, some kind of safety lines, same exact thing that we do when we're doing spacewalks. So I think for me, that kind of technical diving that I did particularly in the Antarctic taught me some of those lessons and have certainly benefited me in terms of being an astronaut. I think they also helped me get selected to become an astronaut. For me, coming from the life science background, you know, our job as astronauts is really as operators and you have to have this operational capability, fixing things and understanding how to think about things in that context. If I were just some stereotypical geeky scientist in a lab, I probably wouldn't make a good, good astronaut because you need to have that well-rounded operational nature. And so I think when I came in and interviewed to be an astronaut, the board saw that I had done things like this technical scuba diving in the Antarctic. I had done things that, 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 taught me these lessons in dealing with and understanding complicated pieces of hardware like that. And so that helped them understand that, okay, maybe she will be a good astronaut. She already knows how to function in these extreme environments and has that experience. So I think it certainly was an asset to me in reaching this goal. Well, Alexander, there you go. <laughs> Lots of things about scuba diving and uh, Thank you. maybe some connections with the team project on the, on the oceans. Uh, we have a, another a good question, uh, Jessica, coming from uh, a marine biologist. Uh, her name is uh, Miley Ui. Uh, Miley? Well, um, hello, Jessica. So I have a question. Um, there has been a huge number of young people pursuing the astronaut care through the inspiration of yourself and many great um, astronauts. Well, myself being here because I read about you. Um, so I'll, my question to you is, what is a healthy way to pursue a career as an astronaut? 
with the understanding that it probably won't, that it might not break your way? Yeah, so that is, it is a tough question in, in thinking about that process. You know, for me, I remember growing up and I always, like I mentioned, I wanted to be an astronaut since I was five. And so people would always say to me, you're so lucky, you have this dream, you know exactly what it is you want to do. And I knew that that was true and I felt fortunate for that. But in the back of my mind, I would sometimes think, but there's such a small chance of it happening. Will I actually ever be content and happy if it doesn't happen, which, you know, it probably won't. So that was always in the back of my mind. And I think what happened was I discovered this whole other career. So it, it was kind of happenstance in terms of how it all rolled out, but life usually does operate that way. So you need to remain open-minded and embrace these opportunities as they come. For me, I felt so fortunate that I had found this other career being a, a field biologist and a physiologist and studying these unique animals that I showed you today. And I thought, wow, thank goodness I found something else that completes me and fulfills me because I'll never become an astronaut. There's just such a small chance of it happening. And so I think that's an important thing to remember is absolutely pursue your goals because if you don't, you won't end up here. And that was a lesson that I learned as well. I had actually applied before I was selected and I didn't get selected. In 2009, I even made it to the final round and I came down here, I interviewed, everything went really well, but in the end, I, I didn't get selected. And so when the opportunity came to apply four years later, I almost thought, maybe I don't need to apply. I found this other career that fulfills me. Do I really wanna go through that mental anguish again and all of that stress when it's just, you know, it's gonna be the same result and it's not gonna happen. And then I thought, okay, well, this is, this is silly. I'm fooling myself here. I can't not apply because then I'll always wonder about it for the rest of my life. And so I think those are kind of two lessons there is not to give up. You have to keep trying because you certainly won't obtain anything or get anywhere if you don't put yourself out there and try. And like I mentioned, sometimes go a little bit outside of your comfort zone. But the second thing is to keep an open mind, to have that, that other backup plan. And it doesn't even necessarily need to be a backup plan. I was so happy in my career. And that's when it almost becomes bittersweet. Now that you've found this other thing that you worked so hard for and that you love, and then I offered the chance to have my childhood dream job, of course, I couldn't say no, but I had, did have to give up that other career. And so there is, you know, I really do miss working with the animals like I used to. So, you know, I think it's important to keep that open mind and to understand other things that might make you happy, but at the same time, keep pushing for it because, you know, I'm proof that your dreams really can come true if you keep at it. Thank you very yeah. much. Uh, great. We, we have uh, more questions on this same uh, uh, topic of your personal trajectory, um, Jessica. Uh, so let me invite uh, Hashmita to ask her question to you. Hashmita. If you can hear us. Yes. yes. Thank you, Juan. Yeah. Oh. Uh, so hello, Jessica. First of all, congratulations on the Artemis program. And yeah, so my question to you is, what was what was your personal journey uh, on on to becoming a NASA astronaut and post your MSS course at the International Space University? And how did it shape out for you eventually? And how was your overall experience? Is what I want to know. Yeah, well, I think I covered a lot of that in the slides that I showed, and that was this trajectory that I followed, which, you know, I didn't have it all planned out. I just embraced these opportunities as they came and things kind of fell into place. For example, like I mentioned, after completing my biology degree, my undergraduate degree, I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do, but I found out about this exceptional opportunity at ISU. Doing my internship through ISU brought me to NASA for to actually get a job there afterwards. So that kind of fell into place where I met astronauts. I worked with them as a scientist, as I was describing, but then knew I was ready to take that next step of doing my own science. That was a really important step for me because I knew that that was always something that I wanted to do to really feel fulfilled and fulfilled and completed. So for me, that whole process, you know, led me to be a scientist and then eventually led me back to NASA. But I think that's one of the most encouraging things for me is that there is no specific recipe. You know, it's, it doesn't really serve you well to just think about checking boxes of like, 
well, what should I do to be an astronaut? I need my pilot's license and Jessica did this, so I should do this. I don't think that's the right way to do it. I think it's to make sure that you're following your own passions and your own heart. And in the end, hopefully you'll end up at the same place. The only thing that you need now in common to become an astronaut is a degree in the STEM fields. So science, technology, engineering, math. And it's so encouraging to look at the diversity in the astronaut office right now. You know, back when we first started exploring space, all of those initial astronauts, they were all white male military pilots. Everybody looked the same. But now we have people from so many different backgrounds because we have this different long duration mission where science is, is the overall goal. And so we still have military test pilots. They make exceptional astronauts, but we also have so many different kinds of people in various backgrounds. We have engineers of various types. We have some life scientists like me. We have medical doctors. So it's so nice to see that there's so much diversity that you can pursue whatever it is you're truly passionate about and still end up in the same place. And I think that diversity also makes us a much stronger office. You know, there are countless examples of studies on earth that show teams that are diverse are much more successful, more productive, and they are much happier as well. So bringing those different mindsets to the table is always the best way to solve a problem. And I know that you're seeing that in all terms of, of all of your teamwork there at ISU as well. Thank you, Jessica. If you would like to uh, wrap it up with your uh, concluding message uh, before the holidays, um, you may want to address uh, a long list of questions that have to do with uh, your Artemis mission. Uh, when are you flying? Uh, what is different in the training? What are the major challenges? Will you get along with your astronaut colleagues? Mm -hmm. And there's even a question, uh, when will the first uh, openly out LGBTQ astronaut uh, fly? So please wrap it up for us. Uh, it's just another challenge for you, Jessica. Thank you so much. Sure. Wow, that's going to be a big wrap up, but happy to happy to take that on. You know, for us as Artemis astronauts, which there are several open LGBT, LGBTQ astronauts within that group, so we are already there. Um, we are now thinking about that next step. As astronauts, we've already been involved in the in the development of the Orion spacecraft and the space launch system and evaluating these systems, particularly from the user interface that we'll experience as astronauts. So we've already been building these new spacesuits, testing those in the neutral buoyancy lab. You've probably seen pictures of our training underwater in the spacesuit, where we are trying to have that neutral buoyancy to compare it to doing the spacewalk in microgravity. Well, now we're actually have some modified systems where we're working on the bottom of the pool so we're replicating that one six gravity that we will have on the moon. So we're already doing things like that. We'll continue to do that and to support the development of all of these Artemis missions. And then as they come closer, so typically we assign astronauts and crews about a year and a half to two years before missions. So Artemis two, which is the first Artemis mission that will have a crew, which will go out around the moon. It won't land on the moon, but it'll go around it and come back. Hopefully that will occur as early as 2023. So, you know, we may only be a year or so away from identifying those crews. And then those crews will be conducting all of that very mission specific training to ensure that they're ready for the mission at that point. So a lot of diversity in those 18 astronauts names that you saw, there may even be more names added to that. And of course our international partners, Canada, just what came out with the announcement that they'll be having two two astronauts involved in the Artemis missions as well. So really exciting. And we're all, we're all paying close attention to see how it all unfolds. With that, I would like to say goodbye to everybody. It's been wonderful speaking to everyone today. And I can't wait for the time when we can once again, all be together back in Strasbourg, hopefully as a reunion with my classmates and an opportunity to meet all of you and to see everybody again. But for now, we'll continue to do this virtually. And uh, I invite you to, to be in touch and send me your questions and I'm sure there'll be more opportunities with ISU in the future. So thank you very much and happy holidays. Please stay safe, a challenging time that we're still living in. But as I mentioned, this too shall pass. Yes, this too shall pass, uh, but not before we take a picture with you, uh, mm -hmm. Jessica, in the name of the ISU faculty who is really very proud to see alumni like yourself. And in the name of the ISU staff, we would like to steal uh, 30 more seconds of your time for a family picture, if you don't mind. Uh, sure let's thing. do that. And uh, happy uh, holidays to everyone.
So let's make sure we are all on the picture, that our cameras are on. And you will be invited to join the green room for a short farewell. Okay, thank you. Merci bien. Merci beaucoup. Balsha Spasiba. Happy holidays, everyone. Спасибо вам.